Now on KGW News. Thousands of Johnson & Johnson vaccines are on the way to Oregon. But should you be worried about their effectiveness? Plus, businesses in Portland's Pearl District get hit during a destructive protest. Graffiti, definitely, I get tired of cleaning up. But I wish they'd find another way to express themselves. See the city's plan to help businesses beef up security. But first, he gained fame with his TikTok dance videos and was even part of the inauguration. Now, this former Portland doctor is being sued for sexual harassment and assault. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brittany Folgers in tonight for Laurel. We just learned the so-called TikTok doc, Jason Campbell, has been placed on administrative leave with his new employer, the University of Florida. That came as they got word of the allegations here in Oregon. Mike Benner breaks down the lawsuit filed against the doctor. He's come to be known as the TikTok doc. His dance moves so impressive, he appeared in the virtual parade across America on inauguration day. Now, Dr. Jason Campbell is making headlines for something far from impressive. This case shows that it's possible to be a hardworking, generally good, courageous doctor and also be a creep that sexually uh, assaults women and gets away with it. Attorney Michael Fuller is representing a fellow health care worker who has filed a lawsuit against Dr. Campbell. The suit alleges that early last year, Campbell sexually harassed and assaulted the woman while she was employed at the VA hospital next to OHSU. Campbell is alleged to have sent this woman sexually charged messages over text and social media. At least one of those messages containing a photo of Campbell's genitals through his scrubs. Campbell is also accused of sneaking up behind the woman and forcibly pushing his body into her. But it appears Mr. Campbell, you know, acted on impulse at times and made bad decisions, of course. But what we see from OHSU is a premeditated decision to bury these complaints. Speaking of which, the lawsuit alleges that the victim reported Campbell to administrators, as did a second woman who had problems with Campbell. According to the lawsuit, OHSU concluded that Campbell violated policies and the code of conduct, but Campbell was never formally punished. The lawsuit also claims Dr. Esther Chu, professor of emergency medicine, went so far as to say it's never worth it, never, in regards to reporting sexual harassment. This case is really important because it shows that OHSU is systematically burying these complaints, and it has been for years, and it's protecting male doctors. OHSU responded with a statement. In part, it says, OHSU does not condone behavior described in the lawsuit. We are continuously working to evolve our culture, policies, and practices to provide an environment where all learners, employees, patients, and visitors feel safe and welcome. Michael Fuller doesn't buy it. He says OHSU is too focused on protecting its doctors. They don't terminate them and they don't make the complaints public. They don't tell patients. They don't tell the Oregon Health Authority. They don't tell future employers. Perhaps upwards of four and a half million dollars will change that. Fuller says that's how much his client wants to be compensated for what she's alleged to have suffered at the hands of Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. the TikTok doc. I try to just put on the best case I can. And at the end of the day, I have faith in the jury system. Michael Fuller says since they filed this lawsuit late last week, a half dozen additional women have come forward with complaints about Dr. Jason Campbell. His attorney tells me that Campbell is innocent and this case will not be tried in the media. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Now to three things you need to know about the COVID vaccine rollout tonight. Number one, eligibility, eligibility just expanded in Oregon. People 65 to 69 years old can now get the shot. Number two, a third vaccine option is on the way. 34,000 doses of the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine will arrive in Oregon sometime this week. And number three, signing up for an appointment is still a struggle for many seniors. I just have a lot of concerns about this new process in addition to the existing. I mean, it's there's just so much confusion. Amber Kern Johnson is the director of the Hollywood Senior Center, one of the groups trying to help seniors with the appointment struggles. She's reacting to a change in the way people book appointments for the Oregon Convention Center. The state is now taking contact information from people eligible and then calling a random selection once an appointment is available for them. There's a new website to sign up for one of those calls. It's getvaccinated.oregon.gov. 
the, you know, people who aren't answering the phone right away as, as we, a lot of people have been trained, you know, let's not, cause it could be a scammer or you know, everyone is checking their messages. And that site is just an added layer. It's not replacing the chat bot that you may have gone through. If you're trying to book an appointment for the OHSU site at the Portland airport, you still have to go through that chat bot. Then there are individual pharmacies booking appointments on their websites, and some are having problems of their own. Walgreens admitted they had some issues after viewers complained to us about glitches that kept them from reserving open appointments. That being said, Multnomah County is doing relatively well getting vaccines into arms. This map shows the percentage of the population vaccinated with at least one dose. For Multnomah and Hood River counties, it's above 15%. All of the counties that you see there in blue are between 13 and 15%, and the counties in gray, well, they're below 13%. That includes Clatsop and Columbia counties. And here's a look at Southwest Washington. You can see Clickitat has one of the highest percentages, above 16%. Clark County is in the middle of the pack, and Cowlitz and Skamania counties are behind. Clark County is set to get a lot more doses of the coronavirus vaccine. Last week, the county's health officer pointed out that they were getting a, were not as getting as many doses per capita as other counties in Washington state. Over the last 11 weeks, the county has averaged around 4,000 doses a week. This week, they'll get more than 14,000. This week, the Portland City Council will consider new rules to help people better protect their businesses from vandalism and damage. It would make it easier to add security lights and gates. And that's something that's at top of mind for many Pearl District businesses today after a protest turned destructive. Tim Gordon reports. Yeah, I mean, graffiti, definitely, I get tired of cleaning up. I wish they'd find another way to express themselves. The graffiti and worse, the broken glass. There was a lot of it in the Pearl after a march turned into a destructive vandalism spree on Saturday night. Some of the targets, a Starbucks and Umqua Bank. We knew it was going to happen. I spent Tuesday through Thursday communicating with anybody that would listen, begging for help. Jim Rice and his wife own the Fields Bar and Grill. They had a window broken out Friday night that prompted them to board up for what they saw coming Saturday. The grill employs 18 people trying to make a comeback from COVID closures. Only for us to be hit with uh, this group coming in and destroying our neighborhood, forcing us to react by putting up boards and protections for our business that we really don't have the money to invest in. Ironically, City Hall may make it easier to go beyond boarding up. An ordinance proposed by Mayor Ted Wheeler and Commissioner Dan Ryan would streamline the process for installing security lights and gates. Oh, it makes me very angry, very angry. And that's what I, I was thinking, okay, we have to do something. We being the people who live here. The Pearl is home to Genevieve Keith, who doesn't want her neighborhood to be locked up like a prison. I'm frustrated, but you should hear some of the community around here. Jim Rice knows he's not alone being frustrated, but instead of spending money on security gear, he wants the city to get police help from the state and even federal level to stop destructive crowds. I have done anything I can right now just to be able to get attention on this particular issue, and yet here we go into last weekend, not enough support, not enough resources, and ultimately we got overwhelmed and our city got damaged yet again. And Rice is concerned it could happen again next weekend. Tim Gordon, KGW News. There's no arguing the pandemic has taken a mental toll on so many people, including black, indigenous and people of color. Problem is, it can be difficult for people in the BIPOC community to find the right counselor to talk with. Going to someone as a client, as a BIPOC client, going to a professional who also is in a shared identity can have a sense of safety and trust. Only 10% of the mental health workforce in Oregon is BIPOC. Dr. Anjabine Ashraf has worked as a mental health professional for more than a decade. She reached out to lawmakers to address the issue. And that's where Oregon House Bill 2949 comes in. It aims at improving the pipeline to get black, indigenous and people of color into the mental health field and address the financial burdens that can make it hard to get licensed. 
our communities are only healthy as all of us are. And if our BIPOC community members who have been disproportionately impacted historically, but also in light of the COVID-19 pandemic aren't well, then our communities cannot be well. The bill is slated for a public hearing this Wednesday.